Hi, I am Jackie Miller, high conflict divorce coach and consultant and host of this podcast, Out of Crazy Town, your guide to divorcing a narcissist. My guest on this episode is an attorney that knows his way around a courtroom after litigating extremely complicated cases for 25 years. Jeff Diamant joins me from Houston, Texas to talk about 10 of the biggest mistakes you can make in your divorce or custody case. And he should know. He has been counsel on some of the most complex divorce cases involving estates worth tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars and complex custody cases as well. Jeff is one of the best divorce attorneys practicing today, and he is joining me to share his insight on everything from choosing an attorney to having the right mindset and everything in between. Okay. Hey, everybody. I have Jeff Diamond on today at Out of Crazy Town, your guide to divorcing a narcissist. Jeff, thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. You're welcome. And I love the title. Uh, we are all truly living in crazy town when we are dealing with these high conflict divorces. So that I, I did a poll when I uh, named this podcast and that came back the most votes by far. <laughs> everybody understood that title. I am so happy that you're here because you have an extensive background, not only in family law, but many other areas of law. They all lend themselves to being very good at what you do. And so I wanted to tell everybody a little about that. Sure. Uh, First of all, I know that you love baseball as evidenced also by the dozens of baseballs behind you. Yeah, you should see the you should see the rest of the office. (laughs) I'm assuming you're an Astros fan. I am. And there's probably probably 60 bats and 100 balls in this office. Wow. Wow. Just, Did you just, play? just in my office. And then I have jerseys in the conference room next door to me. So awesome. Awesome. Hey, I'm, I'm kind of more football. I have to admit, you know, I understand the passion for professional sports. Absolutely. That's cool. Well, if I had to live in, uh, if I had to live in the town of the LA Dodgers, I'd probably like a different sport too. Astros and Dodgers don't mix. No, they don't, they don't, they don't. Um, Okay. So I want to let everybody know a little bit more about you because you began your career. What was the largest litigation only firm in the Southwest handling commercial litigation, personal injury, insurance and aviation cases, which is so awesome because I know when I was looking for an attorney, you want an attorney that's really good at litigation, but then keeps you out of it. Yeah. If you can at all costs. And so a lot of family law attorneys turns out, you know, don't really have a lot of litigation experience, right? Not any real litigation experience. And that's kind of one of the problems is you know, family law lends itself to the wrong kinds of things, right? It lends itself to fee churning, it lends itself to all, all kinds of problems in litigation extending. Mm. And, and that's because of the, one of the main reasons is it's because of the emotions that drive family cases. Yep. And the desire to hurt the the soon to be ex other um, allows for people to be taken advantage of where in most litigation, particularly when you're dealing with corporate commercial clients, uh, it's very outcome driven and and they understand the pragmatic sides, the costs associated with it. And so there's a lot more involved in terms of managing that from a pragmatic sense as well. And those lawyers tend to focus on something that nobody seems to focus on in family law, which is what is the what is the end result of this case? Yes. What are we trying to prove or disprove? And let's target what we do towards that. Yep. To say it another way, I've had I've had disagreements with clients before who have said, look, I want to do X, I want to do Y. And I'm like, look, I, I can do that for you, but it's a waste of your money. And it's more money that's just not going to end up in your pocket. And I don't, I'm not going to do it unless you sign a waiver that says you understand this is going to take money out of your pocket. You understand it's not going to result in anything you want. And and after the fact, you can complain to me that I told yeah. you not to do this. And now you understand why. But if a lawyer doesn't have those ethics, and many of them do not, mm-hmm. then they'll engage the whims of the client clients that are being emotionally driven and not driven rationally or by a pra- by with a pragmatic interest. And that's all we're going to get, touch on all those things you just said. So that's a great intro because we're going to go through 10 mistakes that you feel are the biggest mistakes in divorce that are specific to family law. Um, and you're right. It's its own unique animal because of the emotion.
emotion driven it. And it just is ripe for all kinds of vultures basically kind of come in and use those emotions to manipulate. But I wanted to let everyone know a little bit more your background because you've had such high profile cases and you were on the team that represented, for instance, the estate of J. Howard Marshall, um, right, to protect it from Anna Nicole Smith. Um, and then you've just represented lots of other complex cases and complex custody issues. And you have your history in commercial litigation, complex civil trials, and um, all of that, I know, you know, brings that unique perspective that we were talking about to the family law, um, because also it says here, multi-million dollar divorces, international kidnapping and fraud. Wow. Yeah, I'm still in that case. <laughs> Are you really? Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, if you guys go to Jeff Diamond law.com uh, you can see even more about him but i just wanted to give everyone a little bit of background just you know with your extensive um experience and why you truly understand these big mistakes that can happen in divorce it, it's funny because the the i moved firms as a young lawyer i was somewhere around my third year of practice and, and did so because i was just at, at a firm that didn't seem to want to play real lawyer and they seemed to have a, a pension against trial and while it certainly shouldn't be your goal, you can't be afraid of a trial because you can never get anywhere in a case. So I've moved over with some of the best trial lawyers I've, I've ever known in my lifetime and worked with them for many, many years, which is where I, I really hone the skills of where am I going and how do I get there and how do I get there in the best manner strategically and in the mm -hmm. most pragmatic manner. And we had all types and varieties of cases, which was great because we had to learn different things each time uh, to handle a lot of these cases. So it makes you very adept at moving freely within litigation type, um, which is a skill only a few lawyers have, really. And a couple of things I'm noticing you've said, or a couple of times now, goal-oriented, because the goals get so lost in all of the emotion. And I know when I am working with my clients, what's the goal? Have you and your attorney worked out what's the goal so that I can help you get there? So I'll tell you, I'll tell you, there's two things that you see early and there's two things that you see in cases way later than you should see them in divorce cases. One is the lack of an inventory. You know, what do you mean by divorces, that? All divorce is driven by an inventory, which is what is what is the total universe of assets and liabilities of these people. And then from there, you determine, are they separate? Are they community? Mm -hmm. What are the values of those things? And that's how you start to divide up a, an estate. You can't do it until you know what's in it, right? Yep. I mean, I, I have had, I've been managing a divorce of representing a client for some time where the wife and the, him and the husband keep going, well, why can't we get this over? Why can't we get this over with? Well, and I keep telling him the same thing. Like, I would love to divide y'all's estate, but eventually the two of you need to tell me what's in it exactly. because I can't divide it if I don't know what's in it. And you guys, neither of you want to produce any documents to help us verify what's in the estate or its values. So how am I supposed to get it over? Yeah. And, and that's, that's one problem. And, and I, I get these people who come over after a year and a half, two years of litigation. I'm like, okay, well, do you have the uh, draft inventory or anything that you guys are working on? What's that? Wow. Well, what do you mean? What's that? That's what's in and not in your estate. And, and they've never done it. And, and the second, the second thing that you see way too late, and that is exactly what you're talking about, which is, okay, what do you want? What are you looking for? What, what gets this case settled? Nine times out of 10, nine and a half times out of 10, the answer is either something purely emotional. That's a non-tangible thing. Mm. I want to win. It's a win in divorce. <laughs> nope. Right? Um, I want to, or I want to make it hurt. Or I want most of it. Or yeah. what is it? What is that number? Right? Yeah. What is the estate to know what most of it is? Or, or they don't have any idea. They've never even, as you said, they've never discussed it, never thought about it, don't have a clue what it is they want to get the yes. case over with. Yes. And okay, so this actually brings me to number one. And and folks out there, how I know Jeff is that when I went through my high conflict divorce certification, he presented. And so when I saw a lot of these examples, first of all, I'm going to have a lot of my own personal examples <laughs> with this, which is why I was like, okay, I need this guy on my podcast ASAP. Number one was don't be unprepared or be prepared. And then, and I have a follow-up question to that because obviously what I want to say to this is when you are maybe filing for divorce against someone who you know is going to be high conflict, at least in the beginning, it's going to be a shit show, excuse my language. 
But I, for instance, made a huge mistake not being prepared. But I also did not have eyes and was locked out of a lot of the information. So I know you have comments on a few of those things. So please elaborate on the don't be unprepared. That actually spans both filing for divorce as well as when you're in your divorce and conflicts arise, okay? Yeah. It, it's both. So lots of times you deal with enforcement is basically what we used to call contempt. It's somebody's violating a temporary order or whatnot. You know, those things too, it, it applies to those things too during the, during the pendency of a divorce. But going into it, you, you need to have an understanding of what's in your state. And even if you don't understand what's in it, there are things around that will be useful to the lawyer to help them figure out what is in it. You know, you need documents, you need to know where things are, you need to try to gain as much of an understanding as you can without raising too many red flags to help yeah. us understand what's in your state and what's not. The most prepared you can be is if you come in with a, a battery of documents, even if not all of them are useful to us that you've copied and sequestered over time uh, that give us a, a, a lot of information about what's in the estate or at least enough clues as to where to look or what's going on. And if you pay attention, you'll learn that information even if you don't know it already. If you pay attention. Like, it's striking but not surprising how many people, particularly usually on the women's side, that don't really have any idea what's going on in the estate. Right. They, and I'm not saying you got to force your husband to sit down and show you every document, but it's not hard to pay attention and you'll catch enough about what's going on. Take some notes that you things that you hear, look for documents that you may find, copy those things, sequester those things, not in your car. You okay, what does that mean? <laughs> you don't sequester them in your car, okay? <sighs> You mean don't store them in your car? It, you know, it, that's a really good point. I think it, it's a little difficult because you have to kind of start to get sneaky. Lots of, th lots of times this is not your mindset and how you operate in life. So it's uncomfortable. It's weird. It's scary. You have to be careful depending on who we're dealing, who we're divorcing here. But what I want to emphasize about your point is I knew my divorce was going south <laughs> like way before I filed, right? right? I knew that I, that documents, yes, were, Everything was completely hidden, completely hidden. However, I could have paid more attention. I could have listened. I could have started taking notes. I could, there were definitely opportunities that I could have gotten a lot more information before I got out, but I, I needed to be honest with myself, have the courage to just sit down and do it. There were opportunities. There were. So, he, so here's some ways that you can go about doing that. Um, that can be beneficial. So let's start by way number one which every, is the one that everybody overlooks, and it's the single best one, the tax returns. Yeah. You're obligated, if you're married filing jointly, you're obligated to sign the return along with your spouse. The, the tax returns will tell you not everything, but it'll tell you a tremendous amount of information. I'm going to learn from your tax return. I'm going to learn what companies that you own an interest in as a starting point, because mm -hmm. those companies have to issue K-1s. Right. Uh, I'm going to learn where you have brokerage accounts because those accounts will have created, uh, typically will create capital gains issues. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to learn that as well. I'm going to learn where your sources of income are coming from because those are all going to be on the tax returns. And so that is going to give me a wide variety of information already. And, uh, and that's going to, that's a really good launching pad for me to figure out a lot about what's going on in the estate. It's not going to tell me everything, but it's going to tell me things that the husbands don't want to tell me. Right. It's going to give you the clues. Mm -hmm. as to where to look next. You know, they're, they they never really want you to know everything that it is that they uh, own. That's going to tell you because every corporate entity, every business entity ultimately flows back to something. So even if a person in a divorce has a business entity and that entity owns interest in other entities. Mm -hmm. I may not know what those entities are, but, but ultimately it flows, has to flow back to an entity that is owned by you or you and him or mm. him or whatever. Right. Once I know that, I now know how to dig into the books of that entity to find out what they own so that I can appropriately value it. Right. So right. that those kinds of things you're going to learn from the tax returns. And it's the simplest, the easiest source. And by the way, here's a pro tip. Your accountant who's preparing your draft, your joint return, your married filing jointly return is your accountant too. And he owes you the same fiduciary duty that he owes to his husband, to the right. husband. 
Right. So he has to, if you need copies of those, you can get those from your CPA typically. Pro, pro tip number two, by the way, you know your divorce is coming long before your husband knows. Always. <laughs> Particularly if you're married to a narcissist, because there's no possible conceivable way that you could want to divorce them. <laughs> So well said. Yes, you're absolutely right. Right. And that doubles up for kid issues, too. If there are issues affecting the other spouse's ability to care for the children. Yeah. Document those things leading up to the marriage. What are the events that are concerning and how can I prove those? Were there witnesses to those events? Do I have photographs from them? Can I take notes about what happened and when? So yeah. that if kids are going to be an issue, I've got some solid examples and I don't have you rec recreating from scratch. Well, here's what they did wrong. Because let me tell you, there's just no possible way he could take care of these kids is not going to get you there. No, it's yeah. not. You're absolutely right. So yes, you can be prepared. It is okay to start compiling these things, looking for these things, consult an attorney, which we'll get to actually now in number two, to maybe get some advice on how to prepare. Um, a lot of coaches can even give you tips. So, mm -hmm. okay. So now you're prepared. You need to either go interview an attorney, or I think that this next tip is actually super helpful. If maybe you already even have an attorney and you kind of are like, you know what, this isn't working out. I need a new one, but it is don't believe the hype. So explain to us what you mean by that. Yeah. And I'm going to tie that in. I'm going to tie that in to number three as well, because that's one that you kind of tied them in inadvertently. Number three that I usually give is don't check your common sense at the door. If it sounds wrong, it probably is. Yep. The reason that's important is because don't believe the hype is really intended to address the choice of the attorney in the first place. But even when you're in one, that still can be true. And so don't check your common sense. The door applies to, OK, I've chosen the attorney, but now maybe I don't think that things are going the way that they should be. Am I right or am I wrong about that feeling? Right. Yeah. Yep. So. I was just remembering that the video I previously did on this, don't believe the hype. I don't know if anybody got the reference, but I used a picture of sort of vintage picture of public enemy because that was their song. Don't believe the hype is a sequel. So I don't know that many people probably caught that, but that's what I did. I did, but yes, I got it. I got it. <laughs> so the, the, the thing is there is a lot of information out there about this attorney, that attorney, the other attorney information is only as good as both its source and its recency, as well as the information that's been given, right? So what I especially have seen down here a lot is the information about who are the good lawyers is typically old. You're talking to a couple that's been married for 15 years, who one of which was previously divorced and, oh, you should go to so-and-so lawyer. That's who did mine. They were awesome, which may be true, but there's things that that you may not know now, like, oh, well, that lawyer got a divorce and married a young money grubbing hoe. And so he's so in need of cash that, you know, it's created a problem later on, or this guy developed an alcohol problem, or this guy doesn't want to work anymore. Or this guy's just gotten long in the tooth and he's just not doing the job because he doesn't have to fight. So there's so many things that can change over the duration of time that that information can be old and you can find yourself in a not great situation. And don't believe the hype of the lawyer either. I mean, yeah. I've had malpractice cases where a woman goes in to see a family law lawyer who's got, and they have, she has a fierce adversary, husband has a fierce adversary. And that lawyer will literally sit them and tell, sit her, tell her in the face, I hate that guy. He's unethical. I want to kick his ass in court, you know, and it turns out later, they're actually really close friends. They uh -huh. just lied to you. Yes. <laughs> so many things to say on this topic. I can't even, I don't even know where to start, but I completely agree. And I know my own case, I made a mistake of listening to hype. Like we're going to get him. We're going to go after him. I have an example on the other side where somebody got my ex-husband. She saw him coming a mile away. He had nothing. On, I stay at home mom. I'm mom of the year. I'm the Girl Scout troop leader. I, I don't do anything. They had nothing. Right. So she said, oh, don't worry. We're going to show that she's a drunk, sits home, drinks wine all day. We're going to show this. Show. And he's like, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Pulled me into deposition for five hours, asked me the craziest questions, you know, <laughs> none of which are true. And all the while just billing him, billing him, billing him, billing him. And they got all done and they had nothing. Yeah. And that's actually the second part of that, uh, of the hype issue is first, is it, is it hyper bravado about a lawyer? Is it hyper bravado by that lawyer about his or her credentials or mm -hmm. their desire to kill and maim and slash and burn? Right. Or, or is the hype what they're giving you in terms of 
unrealistic expectations about what they will accomplish for you. We're going to yeah. take money. We're going to spank him in court. We're going to kill him. We're going to crush him. We're going to do all these things. There is virtually no accountability in family court, right? Oh. Unless you're trying to be a good mom, in which case they hold you accountable for everything. Right. right. <laughs> but in the absence of that, there's, there's really no accountability. And so uh, crazy. It, I, I wish I had a really good excuse for why that's the case. I just really don't. And it's a very unfortunate set of circumstances. But that being said, if your lawyer is sitting there telling you they're going to crush, maim, kill, slash, burn, be prepared to spend your time crying, screaming, and vomiting when it's yeah. not occurring. Yeah. Because it's probably not. And, and and that's where the hype comes in. Anybody who's overselling is typically doing that overselling. And and if if they're really, truly good at what they do, they don't need to oversell to you. So, so well said, so well said. And I want to talk to your point earlier about, oh, coming to find out these attorneys are best friends. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little, it's like you said, attorneys are, they're doing a job and you are fired up. You watch these emails go back and forth between your attorney, their attorney. He said she did this. She said that. So you're assuming this big rivalry. You get to court. You have your court date. You're standing out there. Your attorney walks up to their attorney, goes, hey, how are you? And just handshake, maybe even a hug. And you're like, what are you doing? Yeah. They see them in court all the time. They have five other cases together. When they're in the park, they wave to each other. They go home. They, you know, put on their slippers, have a glass of wine, and, and you're you're a case. My most frequent adversary, I've been on the same side of, we've been co-counsel, and we've been opposite sides many times. And yeah. consequently, we've developed a healthy respect for each other. But there, there are circumstances under which that's useful. I, I think that people believe that their lawyer has to be mortal enemies of the one that's opposite of you. And let me, let me give you a tip that never helps you ever. It just drives the bill in the end of the day. You know, I got into a case one time that I represented two brothers who were doctors practicing together. And this particular lawyer represented both wives, but I was the second lawyer for the doctor brothers. And it was funny because I was doing something and the opposing lawyer looked at me and says, you know, I'm glad that you're in there. The funny thing is we'll probably save these clients about a quarter million dollars a piece and they have no idea that that's what's going to happen. They never do. When that's the case, particularly if it's good lawyers on the other side, I know what he's entitled to. He knows what I'm entitled to. We don't screw around with stuff like that. Being a mortal enemy of the opposing lawyer is not necessarily your friend, period. A number of years ago, I remember I had a complicated commercial case, several million dollars in controversy, and the case lasted about a year. There was a very good lawyer on the other side. And in the year of litigation, we never made a single court appearance, not one. And we were able to work the case through and get it resolved. To me, that's to me, it's overselling, and I, I just don't find it to be useful. Right. It's funny too because one of the same brothers got sued on an enforcement and decided not to use me because I had a relationship with his wife's lawyer, who I handled his divorce for and got him a really good deal, and decided to go to somebody who pitched himself as the moral enemy of the opposing lawyer, and now he's finding himself having all kinds of problems because he's getting deposed, they're going through financial, right? all these things are happening to him now. He bought the hype. <laughs> situation that he put himself in. This is why I tied this into number three, which is don't check your common sense at the door. If it sounds wrong, it probably is. You really do need to pay attention to those things. If your lawyer is telling you something and it, and it makes no sense to you and it just seems intuitively wrong, it probably is intuitively wrong. But don't mistake that for it's right, but I don't agree with it, or I think it, it produces manifestly unjust outcomes. That can happen. That, that can be the case. Right. It can be both correct and produce non-desirable or, or, or nonsensical outcome. You know, your lawyer should be in a position to be able to tell you, yeah, I do understand that. And I agree with that. It, it doesn't always produce the right results. Sure. But there are circumstances under which your lawyers will tell you things sometimes that you're like, that does, that just really doesn't make any sense. Right. right? And, you know, that's a little bit of job security for me, honestly, because I have great examples of times that I don't ever tell clients what to do. We talk about what they want and what they think. And like you said, we flesh out if something doesn't sound right. And I have an example the other way where someone came in and she said, I just, this doesn't sound right. I don't get what they're doing. I said, go talk to a couple of other attorneys, ask them. So I found her a couple, she talked to them. They both said, oh no, no, your attorney's doing the exactly the right thing. This is why. Yeah. So she went back to her attorney, like now fully confident, understanding for whatever reason, maybe there was a little communication gap or for, she just got paranoid. I'm not sure, but go check it out. 
you know, listen to your instinct, but then go feel good about it. You would go on a serious issue. You'd go to a doctor for a second opinion. Why would you go to a lawyer? Speaking of my audience, where possibly you've been in a very controlling relationship and instincts have kind of been dampened down, you weren't allowed to kind of follow your instincts. So I know it's it's a skill that you have to redevelop often. And so again, that's where I kind of help people, but uh, follow your instincts, get input from the right professionals. Yeah. And if you can't, if you, if you don't feel comfortable with your lawyer's advice, it's kind of hard to take it. So you need to be comfortable and confident in who that person is and in, in the job that they're doing for you. Which leads us to the next one, which is well, kind of the opposite side of that is don't give loyalty where it's not deserved because you can see situations where people stick with attorneys. Right. So I say in there, and I, I've seen that, I've seen that many, many, many times. And and usually what I, what I say about that is right, it's your lawyer. It's not your dad. It's not your boyfriend. It's not your grandma. The undeserved loyalty is what's gotten you into this mess in the first place. That's why you're in a contentious divorce. You stayed with that person too long and you may have had very good reasons to do so. Sometimes you do, right? There's kids at issue. You need to hit a certain stage before you can be comfortable enough to be able to make that transition for reasons that are beneficial to the kids. These people stayed in relationships that they should have been out of years ago, out of loyalty to the partner when a relationship was clearly one-sided, clearly wasn't going anywhere. It was clearly headed for the same destruction that it's at now. Why do you want to continue to pay for a lawyer who's providing a service that isn't providing that service properly out of sheer loyalty? God forbid you all go get your nails done or your hair done and they screw up your hair or your nails. That person is never getting your business again, right? No. But your lawyer can trash your case. I'm staying yeah. out of loyalty. What? Yeah. yeah. What? I mean, like. Well, I've walked all these paths and I've made all of these mistakes, which is why, you know, I feel entitled to make these comments. But mm -hmm. we as a group and most of my clients are women, although I do have men clients for sure, are a personality type that got into our marriage or relationship because we're very empathetic. We're very trusting. We're very loyal. Um, which aren't bad qualities to have. However, we have to check them in these situations when yeah. they become a detriment. It's, it's, and it's not easy to do because you're fighting your natural tendencies and who you are naturally as a person in order to be able to do that. But yeah. you're in a divorce. It's over, it's done. It's a whole new world and you can fight for yourself or you can not. You, you can continue to be that same person. But in my theory, my, my loyalty, my care, my compassion, my love, all those things go to the people in my life who deserve them, right? Yes. My, starting with my family, wife, children, whatever, that's where it goes, right? It's not going to my soon-to-be ex-spouse. It's not going to my lawyer who's not doing his job. That Those are different circumstances, and I need to be prepared to handle those things differently. Here, here's a tip. If your soon-to-be ex-husband has turned into a shitbag, prior to, or even at the beginning of the divorce, that's who they are. They're not going to change it. And they're never going to show you the same care or concern that you would show them. So why do you want to give it back to them? Yeah. And if your lawyer can't do the job that he's paid to do for you as your fiduciary, why do you want to give it back to him or her? That's kind of where number four comes in on the loyalty. And, and you will see men change lawyers much quicker then you'll see women change lawyers. And, and, and it's not simply because all the women make good choices and all the men make bad choices in, in their selection of lawyer. It's not that at all. I, I have a different sort of standard, for example, even than my wife does about people who are providing us services for money. And so all the time be like, be nice to them. And I'm like, I'm paying them to do that. They're not doing the job, right? Yes, yes. So my being nice is I'm continuing to allow them to try to do the job, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to tell them that, no, this is done wrong and it needs to be done correctly because that's what I paid for. Right. Right. And her point is, yeah, but you can do that nicely, which she's usually right. Exactly. The, uh, that's why we all and, balance each other out, hopefully, right, <laughs> in a good marriage. Right. right. <laughs> you know, at the rate you're paying your lawyer. Yeah. Guys that are getting paid $600 an hour, $700 an hour hour. Yeah, okay, if that is a that is a service provider who if they are not performing their service, you need to they either need to be they either need to be very clear on what you expect and, and if they can't meet it or aren't meeting it, then you need to find a new one. Absolutely. Yeah. And then I'm just going to touch on this real quickly so we don't beat a dead horse, but going back into the don't believe the hype, be, go interview new attorneys, be prepared for that hype though because they're, you know, it's given them a lot of material when you go there and now you're prepared to be sold because you weren't happy with the first attorney. So just, you know, 
my suggestion on that is if you go interview another lawyer, don't necessarily provide them direct circumstantial information about your case when you're interviewing them. You can talk to them about generalities. What happens in divorce under these circumstances? What happens in these circumstances? What if you're dealing with these circumstances? What are the remedies? What are the ways to deal with these issues? And you don't necessarily need to say, in my case, this is what's going on. Okay. Okay. Because if you're now in front of a less than scrupulous lawyer, you're providing them the ammunition. It's like going to like a palm reader or a tarot card reader and going like every time they say something that seems kind of accurate, they're like, okay, well, I'm on to something now. I don't have to stay down this path, right? But exactly. You're, exactly. you're giving them the ammunition to give you the hype that you're trying to avoid and how a lawyer would manage a certain situation. What is their understanding of the law? How these things normally get worked out is the information you're looking for you can take that from the person you're interviewing and plug that back into your situation and see if it's matching what yours is doing. Okay. And if it doesn't match, then you kind of know, hey, maybe I need to be rethinking that. Right. Okay. Now, moving on to the next one. Don't step over dollars to pick up pennies. You made a comment when I was watching your presentation. Is it enough money or not enough money? And uh, so I want you to talk about that. And I have some comments because it's a very hard lesson to learn. And if you don't go in prepared, it's going to tie back into a lot of other things you've already talked about. But go ahead and tell me about don't step over dollars. Right. So, yeah, there, there's a, a truly great longtime hero of a family law lawyer named Tom Connor who helped me early on. And, and I got a lot of training from him in this area of law. And he used to tell the men clients, there's always one asset we're not going to put on the inventory that we're not going to disclose to them. And, oh, really? What's that? There's a dollar amount that you're willing to part with to be over and away from this person. That's it on the men's side. On the women's side, it manifests differently. And the example I, I tend to use this like, well, where in, where in the settlement is the $20,000 he wasted on the hunting trip? I don't know. It's probably in the $9 million that you're getting. But what's really happening there is you're, you're not being outcome oriented. You are still focusing on the same fights that you've been having in the marriage. And, and that is typically one of control with, with a narcissist. Usually what you see is he always gets away with it. He always gets what he wants. He always does what he wants. And that's, what's being fought. And what they're looking for is that one win. I want to best him in some place. And if I can't do it here, 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 then I want remediation for this hunting trip or this car that he bought or whatever it may be and you're missing the you're missing the force of the trees right yeah what normally happens is when when you're doing an inventory of the assets in the marriage many of those assets don't have a direct value or they have one but it's not necessarily immediately easily quantifiable if you had a bank account with a certain amount of money in it i know what the value of that bank account is it's the amount of money that's in it what if it's a business a closely held business. If it's not a stock market, uh, you know, traded on NASDAQ or NYSE, you know what the value of that stock is. But when you're talking about, I have 100% ownership in an LLC that does X, valuing that business can be difficult. So oftentimes, same thing with real estate, for example, or any number of other things that can have questionable values. If, if your lawyer's done a good job, then typically when you're dividing those up, the values that have been placed on those items that don't necessarily have an immediately quantifiable value are typically higher than they really probably are in real life. Right. Now, those assets are moving onto the husband's side. That means they have to be equalized on the other side. I was explaining to a client actually yesterday, like I said, look, if your asset is, if this house is worth a million dollars worth of equity and it's going on his side, he has to equalize that on your side. And that's going to mean that so effectively cash has to move over there. So when what you do when you're really doing these is you put all the assets on there and you get their values. Then you start dividing them up, husband, wife, husband, wife, husband, wife. And then you look at the values of those assets. And at the bottom line, you're getting a total. Mm-hmm. So- Wife's getting under this division, wife would get this many assets and husband would get this many assets. Those things in theory, right? Right. right. So if you're dealing with it, the money is there somewhere that's getting paid to the lawyers. Okay. If the money's there, then great. That's what you need to be looking at is what is my end objective from the dollars perspective. And when I look down to the bottom line and I look at the cash gifts and prizes that I'm taking as a result of that, at some point in time, that money needs to be enough for you or it's not. Okay. When you decide that you want to fight, over this $20,000 hunting trip or this $20,000 for the guns he bought or this $70,000, $100,000 car, whatever it may be, what you're doing is playing right back into it, which is you're picking a fight over a nonsensical issue with a narcissist whose then only goal is to win that fight. 
Mm -hmm. and will do so at any cost or expense. We'll spend more than the $20,000 fighting over the $20,000. A hundred percent. Right. So yep. at some point in time, you've got to decide, it, given the total picture, is this enough for me or is it not? In any non-divorce negotiation, a deal is made when both sides feel like what they got out of that deal was sufficient for them. That's how a real commercial deal gets made. Right. Why is it not the same? Because guess what? You're getting divorced. So that's no longer your husband. It's no longer your wife. You don't know them anymore because you don't. And what I'm looking for in the end of the day is I, this is now a business transaction. And, and is what I'm getting out of this business transaction sufficient for me to say, all right, I'll pull chalks and get out of here. Right. Okay? If you're focused on line item issues, you'll never see it. I, I actually had that in reverse representing a husband where we had undervalued a business interest and the opposing side hadn't caught it. And one of the other aspects of the divorce is there was a trust that had been set up for the kids. And so we were going to parse out some of the trust for wife to manage and some for husband to manage. Neither of them could get it. It was irrevocable trust. Okay. okay he, right. he wanted to get, he didn't want to do the divorce. I told him right there in mediation to do, I said, if you don't do this, they're going to look at this and they're going to realize we have this business undervalued. You're fighting over money that you don't even get. It goes to the kids. Just Why do you want to fight over that? No, I don't want her to manage that much money. I don't want to give her that. You're not giving it to her. It's going into another trust for the kids. It's not hers. Didn't do the settlement. Wife decided to uh, audit it herself. And then they sat down and looked at it and going, we don't think this is an appropriate valuation. We would cost another $400,000. It works on either side. It's true on either side. The flip side of that too is the money being spent to fight over those 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 issues. In the Absolutely. Process. What is the cost of fighting yeah. over those things? I had and- I I had a I had a woman get wrapped around the axle about some guns that the husband owned and what was probably ten thousand dollars worth of fighting over this later, plus an expert to value the guns. Turns out the guns were worth about seven thousand bucks. Spent ten thousand valuing them. It gets tough because I have seen a few cases where just like you described, so there is maybe it's complex business, LLCs wrapped in LLCs, blah, 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 you know, and wife didn't know what was there and really wanted to find out. Attorneys are saying, we have to find out, we have to find out, which is fine. And, you know, so that conversation happens with business valuations. But what I say on my side is, okay, have you really sat down with your own, not forensic, with your own account and your own financial planner, figured out really what it costs you to live? What do you want for your future? What is, what is, let's forget, look at exactly what you need to be happy going forward, because there's going to come a point when this is going to get so deep, you're going to do your business valuations. They're going to come back saying more that they're worth there. He's going to go to have his side. They're going to come back less. This could go on for the next couple of years. We can only guess how much it's going to cost at the end of the day. What is it worth to you that this got settled two years earlier? You got what you needed to move on. And now you are focusing on your own life. I've given that advice many times, which is at some point in time, regaining your life, regaining your sanity and giving yourself a direction and the ability to, to move in a positive place, to move to a positive place and in a positive direction is priceless to you. The longer you stay wrapped up in the divorce, the more difficult it is to do that. You simply cannot get yourself, as long as you're in conflict with that person, you can never fully pull your brain, your heart, your emotions away from it because it has been so long that you've been dealing with it. It keeps yeah. you tied in. The sooner you can cut those ties, yeah. the better it is for you mentally and emotionally, physically, every other way. Um, now, does that mean that you should just simply bend over and take whatever pens he wants to give you so you can be untied from him? No, but no. it does mean that there comes a time where you got to decide for yourself, is this extra that I'm fighting over worth it to me? Or right. is it, you know, I, I had a client once that I came in, she, she'd had a case, she, her divorce had been pending for 2.75 years. We had to get a, sm- a short continuance. We sat in mediation and we finally got her case settled for it. We'd been in the case for four and a half months maximum and got it settled at mediation. And when we did, before she, as soon as the last offer came in and she went to put pen to paper, she started crying. And we're like, whoa, you don't have to do this. Like, if you don't you know, she's like, that's not why I'm crying. And I'm like, why? She's like, I can't believe it's over. I'm so happy that it's done. You, you realize in those moments what a prison it feels like for the person who's caught up in that game that's being played 
typically only by one of you. As frequently as both parties are, are continuing the game, as many times only one of them is. The problem is yes. it only takes one to play it to keep you in that trap. Yep. You've got to do everything you can to get yourself out of it which starts by refusing to play the game. And now I, so, I completely identify with that example. I was in mediation for 12 hours. It ended, we signed, and I bawled like a baby in my attorney's office. The weight like lifted and I, I weighed 10,000 pounds lighter at that moment. So I completely understand that. Um, and speaking of it only takes one and not getting caught up into it, your next example is don't contract the narcissism through your divorce, which you've kind of already alluded to. You kind of already gave the example of. It's a, uh, it's not an illness, right? You can't, you can't pass it not by a virus. Not washing your hands or not wearing a mask, but yet people will still find ways to get it. And in what they do is they will, they, they want to fight the same fights and they want to fight the fights that the narcissist wants to fight because that's how they define beating them. Here's another pro tip. If the narcissist really wants to win that issue, they will give you, they will give up much more oh, yeah. to beat you on that issue. When you realize it's a sum total game and that the outcome in the total pot is what you're after, it's better to use that to your advantage. If you want that, I'm willing to lose that fight in exchange for the following things. And nine times out of 10, you'll get them. You know, what was it? It's Sun Tzu that always says too, he will win who knows when to fight and when not to fight. Yeah. So fighting narcissists on battles that narcissists are picking is never a winning proposition. No. Even if you win, you're going to lose. Because Absolutely. If you, if you beat them, what you get is wrath. Okay. Oh. If, if you lose, what you get is I'm the winning person. See, you'll never beat me. Right, right. A conversation I have a lot of times is we don't want to poke the bear. We know what the bear does. We're not dealing with a you know rational person here. They will scorch the earth. So instead, let's come up with ways to make them think they're winning. You yeah, know, so it's like I had I had a I had a couple who had a, a beach house. So the husband really wanted it. So prior to my involvement in the case, they cut a deal that the house is supposed to be on the market. Like, oh, well, we cut a deal for them to put it on the market, but the deal doesn't say that he has to keep it on the market. So not surprisingly, he took it off the market hey. uh, and did so on his own without any authority or consent from her. And she was very mad about it, particularly because when he did it, they had a really good offer on it that he rejected and then took the house off the market. She didn't really want the beach house. She just wanted him to not have it. I'm like, well, that's asinine because I've got him in a position right now where he's willing to take it, put full value on it and cover all of the carrying costs between now and the end of the divorce out of his side. We just shifted about $300,000 of money onto your side. I don't want him to have it. Really? You don't want it. You just don't want him to have it, but you're missing the advantage. I just got full market value, way more than the house is probably worth. I got you all of the equity out of it. I got all the carrying costs covered by him, not by the community during your divorce. It's about a 300 plus thousand dollar swing to your side. And yeah. you've been telling me from the beginning, what you're going to need is cash to be able to live after this divorce is over because she hadn't worked in 18 years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but but missing what what we accomplished in the process of doing that. And that's because contracting narcissism. I want to fight that same fight. I want him to win that fight. Right. Why? What, you know, and, and the question that people have a hard time answering is how much money would he have to give you to let him win that issue? Right? That's always a great question. It is a good question to ask them too, because there's typically some money. I don't know if he gave me $50,000, then I'd let him keep the house. Okay. Right. I just got you 350. Exactly. Exactly. And right. it, again, here comes the emotion. And I've seen this exact example. And this is where my children had all their vacations. This is, I decorated that house. We built that house together, you know, and I get that. And there's a total emotion tied to it. And so that's where I love coming in to help support because it's like, we need to do some mind shift, <laughs> mindset yeah. shifting here. And yeah. again, get you looking at your future and what's happening. And what does winning look like? Do you actually think he's going to let you win? What do you think he's will willing to do and capable of doing? Do you want to live through that? This is let's Jedi mind trick this. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's use it as leverage. He really wants us. Just like you said, let's get you what you want, but you know, it's a lot, it takes a whole conversation to, to get to the other side of that because I get the emotion tied to it, but it's, it's easy to get stuck in that cycle. That's right. It so. is very easy to do so because it's an emotionally driven event. We basically just already covered that number seven, which is don't cover the winning item. And, and that was a great example with the house. And um, the next one also can be emotional because it has to do with feeling like you win, but it says public spankings cause death and destruction and loss of money. And it has to do with this, like, yeah, um, 
wanting some sort of justice in court, which is hilarious because, right, this sound, it's a, actually a contradiction in terms. Of, they don't go together in family court. So talk to me about how the public spankings don't work. Yeah, you know, that ties into a lot of the, a lot of the same issues in this regard, which is what is your end objective here, right? If I've contracted narcissism, then my end objective is to try to win at all costs. And, and, and that is a, a recipe for death and destruction. The way you see that manifest a lot is the same issue we've addressed, which is the issue of who's going to hold him or her accountable, right? So what I want is accountability. I have an enforcement trial coming up this week over a client who got into a situation where he literally can't pay. He, he will eventually be able to pay again, but he's, he got into a situation where he could not pay. And I've, I've represented this guy for a long time, so I'm handling this trial for him, but he, he can't pay. So he's offered up some other solutions to try to work this out. The uh, ex-wife, ex-wife number one, says, no, I don't care. I either want him to pay me all now or I want him to go to jail. Well, guess what? He can't pay you now and he's probably not going to go to jail. Well, how much money are you going to blow on your lawyer that should be coming to you in some form of child support that you're not going to get back or you will, but you're not going to get it back for a long time in order to publicly spank him. And, and that's what happens. And so like the beach house example, it was not only I want him to not get it, but I want to file an enforcement and I want somebody to punish him for having done that. Right. It, it's not really the court's job to referee every single event right. that happens right. with the kids, with the couples. At some point in time, you have to continue to try to work these things out. Now, there comes a time and place, of course, where some of these events are just so bad that, yes, the courts are going to look at them and go, are you kidding me? Yes. But th those things need to be censored at some point. And, and if a court's not likely to look at it uh, and go, like, this is an outrageous thing, yeah. then you're just wasting your money in an effort to try to get the court to pull down the guy's pants and spank him in open court. Absolutely. Because that's what that's what you're looking for when you do that. And you, you're not probably going to get that and you're right. going to drain a lot of money. That, don't right. get me wrong. There are lots of circumstances under which that happens. I've been involved in an enforcement trial recently where that's practically exactly what happened. And, and the judge's rendition was so egregious on the things that the ex-husband had done. You read it, you're like, oh my God. Wow. Total public spanking. But okay. it was deserved. Sure. And it was a kind of thing that sure. any objective person was going to look at and go, that's ridiculous and outrageous. Oftentimes they're just not. They may be important to you, but if you're lawyer is looking at you and telling you the judge is not likely to crucify this person for this. Right. Heed that yes. because you're just going to spend a bunch of money and you're not going to get it. Go ahead. And once you go down that road of trying to punish that person, you just up the ante again. So uh, you're absolutely right. They're like, oh, really? Oh, really? Well, let me show you this. And this really bleeds into the custody side. And, and again, this is where I have lots of conversations about we have to be real careful to protect your image in front of the judge, that you're not nitpicking, um, being trying to be vindictive, that you're not just pissed off, that he got a girlfriend, that you're not just, you know, so you have to really choose your battles, make sure whatever you put in your declaration, put in paper, bring in front of the judge is really noteworthy um, because no, they really don't care that the kids don't go to bed on time on school nights and eat pizza every night and um, don't brush their teeth. They actually don't. Two pro tips there. One, your narcissistic husband probably only wants his time with the kids to keep you from having it. It's, it's either not to pay child support. It's just to keep the kids from you or just to win. But, you know, I mean, I guess that I guess that tailors into what I usually put as number nine, which is what you can't beat the psychosis. Don't psycho. You can't beat the psycho. Absolutely. Don't don't feed into it. Don't become it. No, it doesn't. They're trying to hook you. Into. This is particularly true if you're divorcing a narcissist. Everybody knows why he's doing what he's doing. It's not a big mystery. So I, I don't need to hear it. You don't need to psychoanalyze it. And in and, and doing so isn't going to get you anywhere. What is going to get you anywhere is moving around it. I don't yes. care why he wants this. I don't care why he wants that. The answer is, so I'm okay to agree to that or I'm not okay to agree to this. Why he wants it or why he doesn't want it doesn't really make any, any difference or it shouldn't make any difference to you. And getting stuck on focusing on that keeps you in crazy town. And we're trying to move you out. <laughs> That's right. We're trying to move you out. And so it does. It just it just hooks you, which is their goal, which is what they're doing anyway. So, you know, there are some circumstances under which wise become useful. They're not because he's narcissistic, but there are times that can be beneficial. Uh, a husband's got a deep, dark secret that he doesn't want exposed and is willing to do whatever to avoid that exposure is a prime example of that. That why becomes very useful to you and very useful to the lawyer. 
that changes the game. And that's a really important distinction to make, like you said, because it's getting wrapped up in the why from an emotional standpoint versus, oh no, this goes in the leverage column under strategy. And I yeah. just had this conversation with a client yesterday, this exact conversation. And we were like, you know what? Can't get worried, caught up in that he did that from a marriage standpoint, relationship standpoint, emotional standpoint. But, oh yeah, you need to tell your attorney this because this is something he doesn't want to talk about. Let's, if you can detach, let you and I talk through it, but this now goes in your leverage column under strategy with your attorney. It's a, it's a critical distinction to know, but, and it usually has to be something um, of pretty good significance. I can, I could lose my job. I could have IRS problems, you know, things like that can be significant. If it's something that could come out that could damage his reputation in the community that he cares more about than his marriage and family, that becomes a significant piece of leverage. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's not going to be emotional justice. It's going to be, it's going to be just to get you to your end goal, which is your goal, which is what we talked about in the beginning. <laughs> and this all does tie together. And so lastly, you want to walk us through uh, not giving up the checkbook? That's a big you, one. You had an example, Susan versus Amy, I think it I was. I did. Yes. Okay. And, and the same lawyer. And I took over both cases. The one that was two and three quarter years in, they had an agreement for the husband to pay the bills of the wife's lawyer directly. Two and three, three quarter years in, that case had been pawned off to a senior associate. Uh, she was not getting any of his attention. Uh, she couldn't get calls returned. Um, felt like a second class citizen a lot, yet the bills were astronomical and and couldn't even get a meeting with her lawyer. Okay. Amy, on the other hand, being represented at the same time by the same lawyer, what would happen there is they would have funds partitioned. When they partition funds, that means we're going to take it out of the community. We're going to give it to each person separate. So she held on to that money. And then when the lawyer needed to get paid, he would have to write, he would have to send the bill to his client who would then write the check. She never had a problem getting a meeting because he's accountable directly to his client for that. Right, right. Okay? So not giving up that checkbook becomes very significant. And who exactly that person feels that he is obligated to answer to. So same thing is true. When you are, when you have a lawyer seeking interim fees, for example, let's say I'm representing the wife and the husband needs to pay interim fees because we're getting to where we need those. It's okay to have the fees go into the lawyer's trust account, but there needs to be some agreement written between the lawyer and the client that says you cannot release those fees until you've sent the bill to me and I've approved it. Really good point. Which is another way to control the checkbook because- yes. When I have funds in trust, I can issue the bill. I can send my copy of the, my, uh, the bill to my client, but I've earned those fees. I can take that money out of the trust account and pay myself. Don't give someone carte blanche to your checkbook because in scenario number one, attorney does absolutely no work and continues getting paid. Scenario number two, he's not getting paid until he does his work. <laughs> so gee, which one? Yeah, he's, account he's accountable to that client. He's not accountable to this client control how that money can be divested. If you were building a house or getting your car fixed and you get to pick up your car or your contractor's not doing a good job and wants to get paid, you're not going to pay them right. until they fix whatever's broken. And if the, if you get the car back and you're like, look, they were supposed to fix the radio. The radio is clearly not fixed. I'm here at the dealer. The radio's not fixed. I'm not paying for this repair. You haven't yeah. repaired it. Why would you prepay your lawyer for those things? Right. You know, let me get on my soapbox for one second. The bad part is that we have to worry about. I find it shameful and yeah. horrifying about my profession that people have to worry about this. And then I have to give interviews and podcasts to tell people to do this, to yeah. try to make their own lawyer who owes them a fiduciary duty accountable to their own client. It's horrifying that this is a thing, but it is a thing. So it all I can do now is help you guard against it. Nobody wants to be in a street fight, but if you're going to be in one, you need to learn how to win it. You know, something I just thought of that I hadn't ever thought of before. Moms particularly will go to war for their kids. Mama bear. In your divorce, you need to turn yourself into your own mother protecting your interests. You are both your mother and you are your mother's child. If you consider protecting your interests the way you would look after your child's interests, mm -hmm. you're willing to do and, and say things to fight for your own self the way you would fight for your own kid. And in, in that context, your interests are aligned with the kid. So yes. by protecting yourself, you're also protecting them. So think about that when you're trying to decide how to react or how to fight for something. Never really thought about it that way until we were just talking about it. I love it. It's a really great piece of advice. Thank you so much for coming on, talking through all of these things. It is all fantastic advice. I get questions about every single one of these things. I lived all of them. 
I, it's like I said, so when you did your presentation for our class, I was like, this is all, you know, stuff I know that people are, are going to be really excited to hear. So you guys, I'm going to remind you, if you just want to look Jeff up, you are in Houston, but you do, are you are licensed in California? Is that correct? Um, no, or, but I can wait, I can wave in. I've, I've had many, many cases out in California, not all divorce cases, but many cases out in California. Um, and typically what I do is I either work with California lawyer and get admitted pro hoc vice, which is super easy to do, or I can actually oh. wait to the California bar, but I didn't yeah. see, I didn't know that. That's another interesting thing that I didn't realize that you could do. I hadn't heard that term before. So, okay, you guys be prepared. Don't believe the hype. Use your common sense. Trust your instincts. Don't give loyalty where it's not due. Don't step up for dollars to pick up pennies. Don't contract narcissism yourself. <laughs> don't coven the, the winning item. Uh, public spankings don't happen. Don't adopt the psychosis. Is that was that what it was? And no, it then, was. Uh, yeah, you can't beat it. So don't psychoanalyze. Don't psychoanalyze it. Thank you, and uh, don't give up the checkbook. So Jeff Diamond, thank you so much. You are at Jeff Diamond D I A M A N T Law dot com. Correct. Yes, uh, yes. If you guys want to go check him out, but I really, really appreciate your time coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh,